Again, that's Exodus 28, verse 36. If you would, stand for the reading of God's word this morning. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead. And Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that, he, that they may be accepted before the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, Lord in heaven, God, we come, Lord, this morning eager to hear from you, from your word. God, I pray as we walk through this portion of scripture, as we look at the clothes, the garments that Aaron wore, Lord, as he was the high priest of Israel, Lord, that we are reminded that all these things pointed forward to your son, our great high priest, Jesus. Lord, I praise you and I'm in awe of this passage this morning as, Lord, you just perfectly connect the Old and New Testament, Lord, as you point Israel and teach Israel, Lord, point them forward, Lord, to their true hope, to their true high priest, Lord, to the only man that was truly holy, your son. Be with us this morning, Lord. Pray that you fill our hearts with awe, with praise, with worship as we walk through this passage in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Today we uh, find ourselves at a really amazing, I, I think awesome, but very interesting passage. And what's interesting about it is it's all about clothes. The high priest's garments, what he would wear as he would perform his duties. 42 verses on clothes. We're going to try to go through as much as we can in this passage, in this chapter this morning. We're going to skip around a little bit, but we should cover everything and, and grasp the main purpose of these garments that the high priest was to wear. Uh, but before we get there, to really understand the clothes and why these are important, uh, we, we need to understand the tabernacle, and there's a reason why this is a part of the tabernacle uh, preparation. The, the high priest and the priest were so connected to the tabernacle. Uh, to understand why these clothes, these garments were so important, you have to understand, again, the tabernacle. So before we get there, let me just do a quick review and just talk about the different parts of the tabernacle, what we have uh, covered so far as we've gone through this portion of Exodus. Again, you, you would enter the tabernacle as a whole, a whole through a gate, through the east side, and you would enter into the courtyard. In front of you as you entered into this gate would have been the bronze altar. As we talked about, this bronze altar would have been covered by blood of the sacrifices that were made on this altar. The courtyard is where the average Israelite, the Israelites were welcome to come, male, female, all the Israelites were welcome to come to the courtyard of the tabernacle. And it really represented earth. It was very earthy. Everything was made of bronze and, and elements that were to uh, protect itself from the, the elements, the, the materials that were made there. It was very earthly. On the other side of this bronze altar was a tent. Only the priests were allowed to enter the tent, as we've seen as we've walked through the tabernacle. Inside this tent portion of the tabernacle, everything was made of gold. And beautiful fine linen, purple and blue. And I was thinking about this. Uh, for us, we see clothes and colors like everywhere we go. But in, in that day and age, it would have been very unusual to see these bright, vibrant colors. It would have been so beautiful to, to the people. As you entered into the tent, right, on the left-hand side, you had the golden lampstand. On the right-hand side, you had the golden table. All over the walls of this tent, in beautiful, uh, bright colors. You would have seen angels of, or images of angels. Inside this tent, this was the heavenly realm. It represented being in a heavenly realm. In front of you was the Holy of Holies. 
where the Ark of the Covenant was. This room was separate from the rest of the tent portion. And it was separated by a massive veil with two images of cherubim on it. On the other side of this veil, on the other side of these two images of cherubim would have been the throne room of God, the presence of God above the Ark of the Covenant. Now, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies or the most holy place, and he was only allowed to enter there once a year. Therefore, the high priest had a very special role to play when it came to the tabernacle, when it came to Israel as a whole. His role was super important and very clearly pointed Israel straight to Jesus. Now I'm going to just point that out before we even get in our passage this morning because all over the passage this morning we see just these, these uh, symbols and these um, analogies that point us forward to Jesus. And, and we see this in the New Testament very clearly that Jesus is our great high priest. In fact, we see allusions to this over and over and over again in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews alone, it's mentioned like 15 times that Jesus is our high priest. This is a, a very prominent theme in the New Testament. And so our passage this morning as we walk through the garments of the high priest points us straight forward to Jesus. Now there's three parts of the passage that I want to cover this morning. The three parts of, of this chapter. The first one is this, the garments of the high priest. The second part of this chapter I want to go over is the ephod and the breast piece of the high priest. And finally, I want to look at the crown of the high priest. And actually, if we have time at the end, after we go through the three parts of this chapter, I just have three application points that I want to kind of point out that I think will be very encouraging for us as a church. I just want to leave with encouragement this morning. But let's walk through the chapter, and we're going to start with the garments of the high priest. If you would look at verse 1, Exodus 28, verse 1, this is kind of an overview of the garments of the high priest. Again, starting in verse 1, it says this, Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, verse 2, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Garments for Aaron, who will become the high priest, garments for the, the high priest that were made for glory and beauty. Now, I think this is interesting because it's actually the opposite of the tabernacle, if you think about it. Right? The tabernacle was glorious and beautiful, but it was glorious on the inside. Right? The inside represented a heavenly realm, angels and gold and fine linen. But the tabernacle was not all that beautiful on the outside. In fact, I compared it to a, kind of looking like a circus tent of some sort. In fact, it was probably pretty ugly, made out of goat's hair and animal skins mainly to protect it from the elements on the outside. But again, this is the exact opposite of the high priest. On the outside, his garments were glorious and beautiful, again, even heavenly. But on the inside, the man was ugly, was earthly. Aaron, in fact, was a sinner. We're going to see that very clearly as we get past this tabernacle portion and get back into the story of Exodus. The very first thing we see is that Aaron was a sinner. His sons, who will become high priests, they were sinners. Every high priest in the Old Testament who ever wore these garments that we're going to talk about was a sinner. Therefore, that's why these garments are so important. The clothes themselves, not necessarily the man, the clothes themselves pointed Israel forward to a greater hope pointed forward to a high priest whose life was just as glorious and beautiful as the garments themselves. And of course, this high priest was Jesus. Again, our passage just points to Jesus over and over again. Listen to John 1.14. It's a verse that we've talked about a number of times. It says this, And the word became flesh, of course, that's Jesus, and dwelt tabernacled, that's the, the Greek word there, that's what it means, tabernacled among us. In, in other words, there's a connection between the tabernacle and Jesus here. And we have seen his glory, 
glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth jesus himself in other words was glorious and beautiful just like the garments the garments pointed forward to jesus again look at verse two it says this and you shall make make holy garments for aaron your brother for glory and for beauty now let me just show you how beautiful these garments are and i want you to think about this listen to verse three you shall speak to all the skillful who I, that's God, that's Yahweh, who I have filled with a spirit of skill that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. Did you hear that? Verse three, I have filled with a spirit of skill. God inspired these men. Can you just imagine how beautiful these garments would have been? beautiful and glorious, even heavenly. Verse four, these are the garments that they shall make. A breast piece, now this is the most important part of all the garments, that's why it's mentioned for, first. It's the most important article of clothing as we will see, a, an ephod. Now most of us don't know what a, an ephod is, but it's kind of like an apron. It would have gone over the clothes and the robe. Uh, if you think of it, when I say ephod, an apron, that's probably what it looked like of some sort. A robe, this would have gone underneath the ephod and the breast piece, covering the entire body besides the head, the feet, and the hands. A coat of checkered work, this coat would have gone over the robe, but underneath the ephod and the breast piece, a turban and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and for his sons to serve me as priests. Now listen to verse 5. They shall receive gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. Now let me stop there. What's that sound like? The materials used for the inside of the tabernacle, the inside of the tent portion, the heavenly part of the tabernacle, the beautiful part of the tabernacle. In other words, the high priest's garments were made out of the same materials used in the tent portion of the tabernacle, which represented God's presence, the heavenly realm. Meaning, the garments themselves on the high priest, the garments taught the Israelites that the high priest represented God to the people. He represented God to the people. Think about this. The high priest brought the inside of the tent outside to the people. Now, I've said this a number of times, and I think it's extremely important. The average Israelite would have never seen the inside of the tent. They would have heard about the gold. They would have heard about the bright colors, the fine twine linen, the glory and the beauty of the inside, but it would have been a mystery to the average Israelite, but every time the high priest walked around the courtyard, his garments brought the glory and the beauty of God to them. Now this is obviously symbolic because no clothes, no matter how skilled the people are, could truly reflect the glory of God. But it taught the Israelites a powerful lesson. It taught them that the, the high priest was the go-between between, between God and man. The high priest represented God to the people. When they saw his garments, guess what? They saw the inside of the tabernacle, the heavenly realm, the throne room of God, the presence of God. Now what does that sound like? Turn with me to John 14. Okay, okay. John 14, verse 8. I hope you've seen as we've gone through Exodus that there is this just connection to the gospel of John and Exodus. And John has Exodus on his mind when he's writing the gospel because Jesus is making clear connections between Exodus and his ministry and who he was. John 14, 8. Philip said to him, that's Jesus, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Right? Philip, one of the disciples, say, hey, show us God. We just want to see God. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, 
Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Philip, you can't go into heaven and see God. You're not holy enough to go into heaven and see God. But guess what, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why? Because Jesus is the image of God. He is the glory and the beauty of God. He left the heavenly realm to come down to earth to display God's glory to mankind. Colossians 1.15 says this, he is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3 says this, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. The high priest's garments radiated the glory of the inside of the tabernacle to the people. In the same way, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God here on earth. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this, in their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Jesus is the image of God. He radiates God's glory. Turn to John 17 real quick. John 17, again, there's this connection with Exodus and the Gospel of John. John 17 is really an amazing chapter. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. It's an amazing chapter. It's titled, The High Priestly Prayer. So stop there, the high priest. Jesus is our high priest. This is what he prays for us. That's what's amazing about this chapter. If you want to know what, what Jesus prays to the Father, what he, what he intercedes for us, what he, what he says, what he prays for us, this chapter gives us a clue. <laughs> It's an amazing thought. As our high priest, this is what Jesus prays. Look at verse one. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, listen to this, glorify your son. Now that's interesting. It's interesting because this is a prayer for us, his disciples, and the very first thing he prays is that he may be glorified. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Did you hear that? He prays that he may be glorified. Why? Well, look at verse 2. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to, to all whom you have given him, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you. Eternal life is experiencing knowing God forever. Being in the glory of God forever. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is, is equal to knowing God, but there's a problem. He's in heaven. We're on earth. He is holy. We are not. Therefore, God sent Jesus to us, to earth. Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, look at verse 4, I glorified you on earth. Having accomplished the work that you have given me to do, and now, Father, glorify me. in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existence. Listen, as our high priest, Jesus wants us to see his glory so that we can experience the glory of God. He came from heaven to earth to display God's glory on earth. He said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He is our go-between the exact imprint of God's nature. He radiates God's glory. And that's exactly what the high priest garments did. 
the garments brought the inside of the tabernacle outside to the courtyard, to the people. His garments displayed God's glory to the people. And turn back to Exodus chapter 28. Because that's only the first five verses of this chapter, and there's 42. And Daniel's going to be mad with me if I don't get through this entire chapter. So. The second part of this chapter is the ephod and the breast piece. The ephod is talked about in the uh, verses 6 through 13. I remember this looked something like an apron. So picture an apron that would have gone over the clothes and the robes that the high priest would have worn. Verse 6, it says this, and, and they shall make the ephod of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and with fine twine linen skillfully worked. Again, same material used in the inside of the tabernacle. Verse 7, it shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that it may be joined together and the skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it and be on one piece with it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. Now listen to verse 9. It says this, you shall, you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on one stone and, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in the order of their birth. As a drawer engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree. Now, that means these two stones have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they're in, set in gold settings. Listen to verse 12. And you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. Did you hear that? Two onyx stones set in gold, which held up this ephod, this apron, placed on Aaron's shoulders, the high priest's shoulders. The stones had the names of the tribes of Israel engraved into them, six on one shoulder, six on the other shoulder. And look at the end, verse 12, it says this, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. This means every time the high priest performed his duties within the tabernacle, he bore the names of God's people on his shoulders. Meaning, not only did the high priest represent God to man, but the high priest also represented man to God. Again, verse 12, the end of verse 12 says, and Aaron shall bear their names, that's God's people, bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. One commentator put it this way, whenever the high priest put on his ceremonial robes, he lifted the people onto his shoulders and carried them into the presence of God. Now this is the, the ephod. Let's look at the breast piece. Let's skip down to verse 15. It says this on verse 15, you shall make a breast piece of judgment in skilled work in the style of the ephod, you shall make it of gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen shall you make it. Now, this breast piece would have hung on the ephod. One of the purposes of the ephod was just to hold the breast piece into place. It would have hung on the chest of the high priest, on Aaron's chest. It would have been a square, again, a breast piece. Now, the ESV translates, translates it breast piece instead of breast plate. Many of your other translations say breastplate, and most of you are probably used to hearing breastplate. I'm not exactly sure why the ESV does this, but, but breastplate makes it sound like it was made out of metal. This is my guess. Therefore, breast piece may be a better translation because it wasn't made out of metal. It was made out of fabric, right? not metal. Again, look at the end of verse 15. It says this, you shall make it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns. 
fabric, of fine twine linen, shall you make it, verse 16. It shall be square and doubled, a span its length and a span its breadth. You shall set it in four rows, rows of stones. Meaning on this breast piece, it would have been in front of the, the high priest, right, over his heart, there was four rows of stones, precious, costly, beautiful stones, right, right there in front. Now, I'm not going to try to pronounce them. They're all uh, laid out there. Uh, I'm not going to do this for a couple of reasons. First, I don't want to make a fool of myself. A second, um, we don't know exactly sure what type of stones were there. It's the, we lost a lot of the meaning of the Hebrew over time. What's important about the stones, and this is where I wanna, want you to, to grasp, is, is that these stones were costly. They were different colors. They were beautiful. And they were in rows of four. In fact, four rows of three, which if you do the math, that means there was 12 stones altogether. Now, look down at verse 21. It says this. There shall be 12 stones. Again, this is on the breast piece. There shall be 12 stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like cynics, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. On this breast piece, again, 12 costly, beautiful, different color stones set in gold, and engraved on them are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of God. Now skip down to verse 29. It says this in verse 29. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. This means every time the high priest entered the holy place, he both carried the Israelites' names on his shoulders and on his breast close to his heart. John Mackey writes this, as well as having the names of the tribes on his shoulders, verse 11, perhaps implying bearing the burden of their guilt, Aaron also Aaron was also to have their names over his heart, implying that they were constantly in his thoughts. When he came into the Lord's presence, he was there to represent the nation and to act in their interest before the Lord. Again, who does that sound like? Jesus. When you think about it, the high priest was one man. One man in all of Israel, he was one man who represented the whole nation, all of God's people. This one man represented them, bearing them on his shoulders and carrying them on his chest near his heart. The garments of the high priest pointed Israel forward to Jesus. And this keeps going to, look at verse 30. And in the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim. Now, what are these? What is this? To be honest, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the Urim and the Thuim is. The words themselves in Hebrew mean something like light and perfection. Probably most theologians believe, as I've been studying this, that they're probably some kind of stones. It seems like the Israelites were somewhat familiar what these were because there's not that much description of what they are and how they are to be used. And I think that that was on purpose, but, but look at verse 30. It says this, and they shall be on Aaron's heart. So whatever these are, these stones, they shall be on Aaron's heart. Since it, we're talking about the breast uh, piece right now in this passage, that probably means they were on the breast piece or in the breast piece somehow. Maybe some kind of pouch that these two stones were in, these two types of stones. And they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. So what is this? Again, most theologians believe this is two kind of stones, and these two kind of stones were ways of making decisions or judgments. In fact, I don't know if I love that word judgments, because when we think judgments, we automatically think like judging someone. 
But this was more like making a decision. In fact, some of your translation even say the stones of decisions, right? To make a judgment, and if you have two decisions, which, which way should I go in this? And the Israelites are trying to make a, a judgment on a decision. They would go to the high priest and make a judgment through these stones. Again, most theologians believe that, that he would reach into his breast piece as he would come to the presence of the Lord, probably the tent, and pull out the Urim or the uh, Thummim, and God would direct the high priest and the people by this means. It's kind of like casting lots. That's what most people believe that these were used for. Now, you have to remember at this point, the Israelites really didn't have any scripture. Moses was writing the Pentateuch, the first five books of scripture. So they didn't have scripture to go to. So God directed his people through supernatural means in different ways, through talking to Moses and, and different uh, means of directing his people. And one of the ways was through the highest priest's garments. Again, the Urim and the Thummim. Now again, these words mean something like light and perfection. Let me just ask this, what's that sound like, light and perfection? Jesus. I believe even these, the Urim and the Thummim, pointed forward to Jesus because listen to Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. It says this, long ago, at many times and in many ways, he's talking about the Old Testament, there was many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But listen to this. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In these last days, God's directed us by his son who is our great high priest. In other words, Israel would go to the high priest for direction and, and judgments on things. We are to go to Christ and his word. And he directs us as our great high priest. So this brings me to the last part of our chapter this morning, the crown on the high priest. If you look, look at verse 31, again, the crown on the high priest. Verse 31 says this, you shall make the robe of the ephod of, of all blue, all of blue. Uh, it shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it with a woven binding around the opening like the opening in a garment so that it may, be, it may not tear. On its hem you shall make pomegranate and blue and purple and scarlet yarns, uh, around its hem with bells of gold between them, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he does not die. Now, that last little phrase, so that he does not die, tells you that this was a really serious thing. <laughs> in fact, it was dangerous to be a high priest. And we see that even Aaron's sons eventually get consumed by God's holiness because they didn't do exactly what God said. They were to, to, to make these garments exactly the way that they were supposed to, and Aaron was to wear them exactly the way he was supposed to. Now, at the bottom of his robe, there was to be golden bells and pomegranates, and they were to go golden bell, pomegranate, golden bell, pomegranate. These pomegranates weren't real pomegranates. They were made out of yarn right, by skilled workers, so they were beautiful representations of pomegranates at the bottom of his robe. Now, there's a lot of guesses why bells and pomegranates. I just think when he walked around, I want you to picture this, in the glory of the inside of the tent, as he walked around the courtyard, you would hear him, and you would see these garments. I think the pomegranates probably point back to the garden, and the tree of life. Again, connecting the garden and the tabernacle. But what I want to focus was, what was on Aaron's head? And this is where we started this morning. Look at verse 36, it says this, you shall make a plate of gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a blue, by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead. Meaning, on Aaron's head was this turban, 
And fastened to that on Aaron's forehead, you should picture this, was a gold plate. A gold plate that would go across his forehead would look something like a crown. In fact, Exodus 29, the next passage, and Leviticus 8 actually call this the holy crown that the high priest would wear. So when you think of this, think of a gold crown. Engraved on this crown was the words, holy to the Lord. In other words, this was a holy calling. Again, look at verse 38. It says this, It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they, that's the people, that they may be accepted before the Lord. This crown declared the high priest to be holy, even though he wasn't. He was declared holy by this crown, and therefore he was able to, to bear the guilt of the, the nation. Again, look at verse 38. It says this, He shall, shall be, it shall be, this crown, it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. Why was this so important? Well, let me just read what one theologian said. The high priest entered God's holy sanctuary to bear the guilt of for Israel's sins. Whenever the people sinned, they, they brought their holy gifts, meaning their offerings and sacrifices, to the tabernacle, and then the high priest presented them to God. God would only accept them on the basis of a sacrifice, and, and for the sacrifice to be accepted, it had to be offered by a holy priest. This is why the statement on the, the high priest's forehead, his crown that was on his head, was so important. It confirmed that God regarded him as holy, and thus it gave assurance that the Lord would accept his people's sacrifice. The high priest was holy on behalf of the people. Now, there's one major problem with this, a huge problem, a very obvious problem as you go through the Old Testament the high priest wasn't truly holy. He was a sin-filled man. Again, that becomes very obvious in, in the, the portion, the, the chapter after the, this portion of Scripture we're in right now. And Aaron was a sin-filled man. Again, we see this throughout the whole Old Testament. This is a major problem. In fact, turn with me to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. If you don't know where that is, it's a, it's a minor prophet, meaning if you go to the New Testament, make a left. Go backwards a few books and you'll find it. As you're turning there, let me just give you some context of what is going on in this passage. Zechariah is a prophet. And in this chapter, God is going to give him a vision Again, we learn in Hebrews 1, this is how God spoke to his people through prophets in many ways. One of the ways was giving the prophets visions. Zechariah 3.1 says this, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest. Again, this is a vision of Zechariah. He sees Joshua, the high priest. Now, this is not Joshua from the book of Joshua. That was years earlier. This is years later. Two different guys with the same name. This Joshua was the high priest of Israel during this time. God was showing Zechariah this prophet, a vision of, of the high priest of Israel, Joshua, the high priest. Again, verse 1, then, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Accuse him of what? Being a sinner. Satan is standing there saying, this man, this high priest is a sinner, unrighteous, unholy. And you know what? Satan was actually right. But before Satan can say a word, I love this, before he can say anything, look at what happens, verse 2. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Now look at verse 3. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed 
with filthy garments. I want you to think about that for a second. I mean, this was the high priest. He was supposed to be clothed in these beautiful, skillfully worked, glorious garments, but he's standing there with filthy garments on. In fact, the word filthy that's used here, it means something like vomit or even worse. In fact, it it probably is somewhat of a curse word. A word not appropriate for me to say here in the pulpit. It's obviously a problem because the high priest represents Israel to God. Where is his glorious garment? If he's representing Israel to God, he needs to be holy. And he wasn't. He wasn't in his glorious and beautiful garments. He was clothed with filthy garments. And look at what happens, verse 4. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And he said, and, and to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments, or pure garments, pure holy garments. These are the pure garments talked about in Exodus 28, these glorious and beautiful garments of the high priest. He clothes him with them. Listen, this is the gospel. It's the gospel. God replaces this man's filthy garments, which represented his sins and iniquities and really the iniquities of his people. And and he replaces them with clean clothes, the glorious garments, the glorious clothes of the high priests. Symbolizing that God has taken away his iniquities and clothed him with righteousness. In other words, he declares him righteous, holy to the Lord. Now, I'm just imagining Satan standing there as he's doing this saying, but he's not righteous. (laughs) He's not holy. How could you do that? Look what happens in verse 5. And I said, let me stop here, who's the I? It's Zechariah, right, the prophet, this person getting the vision, meaning, meaning he interrupts the vision. <laughs> he's watching this, and he's supposed to get, get information from God. To re- he's revealing these truths. God is revealing this truth to Zechariah, and he interrupts the vision. He calls out to God. And I said, let them put a, a clean turban on his head. Now, why was that such a big deal to the prophet? Remember what was on the turban. The crown with the words, holy to the Lord. It was a crown that declared the high priest holy even though he wasn't. He was declared holy to God. That's why the crown was so important. Look at the end of verse 5. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. Therefore the high priest was declared clean. Even though he wasn't, he was declared clean. God, God put on his head a crown that declared holy to the Lord. But again, there's still a problem. How could God... Just declare someone holy. Especially if he isn't holy. How could God, who is just and holy himself, not condemn a sinner like this high priest? Again, these are the questions I'm sure Satan was asking as God was doing this. And you know what the answer is? Jesus. Turn with me to John 19. Again, there's this clear connection between John and Exodus, the Gospel of John and Exodus. And and in the Gospel of John, Jesus also wore a crown. 
chapter 19, verse 1. As, I, as our high priest, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Let me just ask a question. Have you, have you ever wondered why thorns? It's partly because it's painful. You imagine these massive thorns, inch long, put on your head and digging into your skin. But let me ask another question. Where did thorns come from? Think Genesis chapter 3. From the curse of sin. Listen. On the cross, Jesus bore the curse of sin so that we wouldn't have to. It's so important. Listen to this. Joshua the high priest was declared holy even though he wasn't. And he wore a crown that said, holy to the Lord. Jesus was declared a sinner even though he wasn't. And he wore a crown of thorns, the curse of sin. Listen, that's the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, for, for, for our sake he, that's God, for our sake he made him, that's Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, the priestly garments become a, a perfect metaphor for those who have put their faith in Christ. Even though we are sinners, our lives are, are filthy garments, even our good deeds are filthy rags, according to Isaiah. Even though we are sinners, God covers our sin, filth, and guilt with the righteousness of Christ. He clothes us with Christ's own righteousness. Now let me just point out one more thing before we get to some application about the garments. One more thing about the garments. The, the word garments is used one other place in the Pentateuch, and I think there's meant to be a connection here. In fact, it's used in the garden. And we've seen a connection between the tabernacle and the garden over and over again. There's a connection between the garden and the tabernacle and the priest garments, and Genesis 3.21, which says this, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. God clothed Adam and Eve's nakedness with garments. He covered their nakedness, their shame and guilt with clothes. Now think of Christ for a second. How was he crucified? What was he wearing? Nothing. He was naked. In other words, Christ took on Adam's nakedness, his shame and guilt, so that Adam could be clothed with Christ's righteousness. There is so much here in this chapter. I wish we could just keep going, but let, let, let's end. I, there's, I have three application points that come from this chapter, and, and I want to talk about these application points real quickly because I, I want to leave this morning just encouraging you. I think our church can just use some encouragement this morning. Three quick applications points from Exodus chapter 28. The first one is this, very simply, Jesus loves you. He loves you. Not only did he become sin so that you could become righteous, you're, you're, you could become forgiven. Not only does he clothe us with his own righteousness, but, but think of the priestly garments. It's pointed forward to Jesus. Think of the ephod and, and the names of, of his people on the shoulders of the high priest, bearing them on his shoulder, bearing their guilt. Think of the breast piece with the names of his people on his breast, close to his heart, written on valuable stones. Listen, if you, haven't, if you have, have trusted in Jesus, if he is your Lord and Savior, you've trusted in him, I want to just be really clear. Jesus loves you. 
If you're a Christian and believer this morning, Jesus loves you. Satan may be accusing you just like Joshua, but if you've put your faith in Jesus, your sins have been forgiven. This brings me to a second application point. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. He's the radiance of God's glory. He came from heaven to earth to display God's glory. In other words, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Study Jesus. Model Jesus. Proclaim Jesus. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. This brings me to a third and final application point. Jesus represents us to God. Did you hear that? Jesus represents us to God. You know how much encouragement and and just courage that should bring to you if you're a believer this morning? Just think about how much peace and confidence that should bring. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father now in heaven, in the throne room, in the holies of holies, not once a year, but now continuously. The Father's right hand as our high priest advocating and interceding for us. I just want to end this morning with a passage I go to often here. But hopefully maybe there's some new meaning to it as we've talked about the high priest and how it points to Jesus as our high priest. Let me end by reading Romans 8, 31 through 39. Verse 31 says this, What shall we say to these saints? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? Think of Satan, right, accusing Joshua. Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, gave him up for us all. Who will not graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? It is him who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or disease or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor anger nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor power nor height nor depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, Lord, I pray if there's anyone listening right now that's just discouraged because of illness, because of tragedy, because of trials. Lord, I pray if they have put their faith in you, if they have truly trusted in you, Lord, that they would hear this message today that that you are our high priest and that you love us, that our names are, are written close to your heart, Lord, that you intercede for us God, I pray that that's just an encouragement, Lord, to this morning. Be with us, Lord. I pray that we worship you with our lives because of your goodness, your grace, your beauty, your glory. In your son's name, amen.